and the struggle to find good lighting to film in at this time of year is very real so I apologize if it's a bit dark today or if it looks a bit off but uh, the process for preparing for this video took me a really long time and so here I am now. <laughs> uh, the reason it took such a long time to prepare for this is because I am updating my 1970s project. So if you don't know what this is, this is a reading project that I started, I believe in the spring of 2019. Um, and it is around reading literature that was published in the 1970s. And so I compiled a very long and what I thought was exhaustive list at the time of award winners and bestsellers from the 1970s trying to pinpoint um, what it is about 1970s literature that I find appealing and that I really want to read and feel compelled to read. And I picked 10 books that I was going to read for the first round. So this project taught me many different things. I'm going to try to be very succinct about them today so that this video doesn't get too long. One of the things that this project taught me was that picking 10 books for a project, for a reading project for me, is too many. Uh, that is because I can't read them fast enough to get out content around that subject matter in a way that makes sense to me, in a timeline that makes sense to me. As you can see, it's been a year and a half since I recorded the original video and I would have been finishing the last read um, this past month in November if I would have read that book. So my first 10 books were, um, I picked one from each year in the 1970s decade from my compiled list. Uh, I didn't do a count today, but I had, I think, 60 books on this list. It was a really large list. Uh, so the books that were successful on this list all fit into a kind of themed category for me, most of them. There were a couple that didn't fit into that category, um, and I'll talk about them here. So the books that fit into this category, which was female empowerment and um, a kind of back to the land, like um, women stepping away from patriarchal society and um, reasserting their wildness, reasserting their freedom were uh, five of the books that I read. That was their main theme. And they tackled it in very different ways, some of them more successfully than others, but they all tackled that issue. And I found that to be a really compelling issue that I felt drawn to and I think kind of emerged at this period because of course, in a lot of Western nations, uh, feminist the feminist movement was coming to the fore in um, white women's consciousness. So um, again, there's a lot of gaps in this list, the original list, that I didn't notice until I started reevaluating it. So these five books were all written by white women. Um, and I feel like I've kind of found a theme that obviously being a white woman I can identify with but I also challenge myself today to go deeper. So those five books were Surfacing by Margaret Atwood, Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion, Heat and Dust by Ruth Prower Jabvala, Bear by Marian Engel, and Who Do You Think You Are by Alice Munro. So three of those writers were Canadian, one American, and one uh, woman who was born in Poland, lived in England, and also lived in India. So she had a very kind of unrooted sense of self. Um, so all of these books deal with uh, themes of abortion, themes of fertility rights, themes of um, 
women very much present in the decade of the 1970s or in Play It As It Lays case, like the late 1960s. So this kind of awareness and consciousness, some of the women become very empowered and move forward, such as in Bear by Marin Engel. And um, Who Do You Think You Are is actually a series of short stories about the same character that you follow with Alice Munro. Um, and Heat and Dust is actually a dual timeline, so you have a 1920s timeline comparing with a 1970s cat timeline. And this is uh, both coming from a women's perspective, both dealing with fertility, abortion, issues around sexual freedom. Um, so I, I think that, that that realization that that theme was there for me was... A really interesting one and some of the books in the next series that I'm going to be reading are also covering those issues and tackling those issues so I think those are things that I'm going to keep exploring in this project going forward. Two of the other books out of the ten that I really enjoyed were The Thorn Birds by Colleen McCullough and The Bloody Chamber and Other Stories by Angela Carter. Obviously those books not set in the 1970s. So they were historical fiction and kind of uh, fairy tale retellings, um, not set specifically in the 1970s. So they were books that I really enjoyed, but they didn't really fit the theme of what I was going for. Um, one book that I read that I didn't really enjoy was In a Free State by V.S. Nepal. And I think that despite the fact that he was tackling issues that are really important and valid ones, um, I just didn't get along with his writing style and I couldn't really get over that through the whole story. Similarly, I tried to read The Conservationist by Nadine Gordimer, which is a South African novel, and I struggled with her style of writing. I could not attach to anything concrete, and due to time and due to kind of a fading interest in this project in a way, I just decided to DNF that book. When it came to the final book um, on that list, which is The Temptations of Big Bear by Rudy Weeb, I had somehow convinced myself when I was making this list that Rudy Weeb was a First Nations man, an indigenous man, and he was not, he's a white man. And despite the fact that this book was very well um, critiqued in terms of its dealing, its way of handling indigenous issues, I've made a pretty strong commitment at this stage in my reading to not read um, interpretations of indigenous culture through the uh, through the lens of white writers. And you know, I'm not saying that white writers can't accurately depict an indigenous experience, but at this stage, I really want to seek out and um, promote for myself the own voices of indigenous peoples and I'm not really interested in having that through a white lens anymore. So what I ended up doing after this experience, after deciding not to even read that 10th book, was to go back to the list, look at it very, very critically and really call it. And I did that. I went through, I just took out books that you know, were a maybe, because I put some yes to read, no to read, or maybe. I took all the no's off. I took all the maybes off. I went through the ones that I had said yes to and looked at the writer and researched the writer a bit more to make sure that these were actually perspectives that were present of the 1970s. So they had a voice that was accurate to that time period. Um, and also that they were representing own voices as much as possible. And I think I was able to achieve that better with this second culling of the list. I got the list down to 34 books, uh, 13 of which I have read, and I have 21 books left on the list to read. So the next step in this project is um, to pick out five more books, and then I will make a second video around these books and I think several of these books can also speak to these original themes that I really enjoyed out of the five I mentioned earlier but we're diversifying the voices so these books are shifting a little bit into a different area but they're really still staying hopefully in in a lot of the same themes 
So the first book on the list of five is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, which was published in 1970. So I have not read any Toni Morrison, which I feel like is ridiculous at this stage. So I need to begin. And a lot of people begin with The Bluest Eye because that was their first published novel. And that's where I'm going to begin as well. I think we all know this story. I believe the protagonist is a little girl, um, an African-American girl who uh, is kind of internalizing the ideals of beauty that she sees around her, being that she wants to have blue eyes like a lot of white uh, American girls that she is exposed to. Um, so that will be book number one. Um, the second book is called Half Breed by Maria Campbell, and this is actually a nonfiction book. I did add a few nonfiction books to the list. I didn't have any on there before, but I felt like it was necessary to add those in because um, finding own voices novels can be a little bit more challenging to do the research, especially when you're looking at a past decade. I mean, there's a ton of um, indigenous novels from now and from the 80s and the 90s, but going back into the 70s was a little bit more challenging to find and I was searching out indigenous authors from Canada that I could look for. And so Maria Campbell came up. Maria Campbell is Métis and this is her memoir of her life um, and the things she went through growing up. Uh, number three is The Women's Room by Marilyn French and this was published in 1977. So this is one of those quintessential feminist novels from the 1970s. Um, Marilyn French is a, an American writer. And I, I did struggle a little bit because I thought I've read a lot in this area, but I do really want to have a very good breadth of feminist writing, you know, across the board. So I figured I would keep this one in and, and give it a try. Um, the next one is Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown, and this was published in 1973. And this is a coming-of-age story based on the period of uh, Rita Mae Brown's own life. She was um, a bisexual woman and about her kind of coming-of-age and realizing um, her sexuality. And so it's considered to be kind of a um, LGBTQ plus classic. And then for number five, I'm going to read Oreo by Fran Ross from 1974. And I actually learned about this book from one of the uh, booktubers who did the Amplify Voices tag that I um, created back in June. So I will link her video down below. And this is actually a satirical novel, which makes me slightly nervous because when things are supposed to be funny, I don't necessarily get the funny, but I really wanted to try this one out because it is a very specific perspective of a young woman whose father was white, Jewish, I believe, and his mother was black. And so this biracial experience growing up in, I believe, New York. So these are going to be my five books that I will continue on with the 1970s project. I was contemplating whether to kind of abandon the whole thing altogether. But I do really enjoy exploring this decade and exploring more of the literature that came out of it. And so I just wanted to make it a bit more concise, make it a bit more, make it more diverse as a list, um, and to challenge myself to really um, make sure that the voices that I'm reading from are as wide as possible and not that very narrow area that I was. Uh, inclined to go towards and you know I think what I like is what I like and I don't think there's anything wrong with those books but I do feel like I need to find some other perspectives and contrast them with these specific perspectives that the 1970s literature have revealed to me thus far. So thank you very much for watching. You can expect uh, an update to this project video sometime in 2021 because I'm sure I can get through five books much faster than I was able to get through 10. And I will be back again soon with another video.